Hold on, y'all. My computer acting slow. Just give me a second. Okay, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa afdulu salatu wa tamu taslim, ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een, wa radiyallahu ta'ala ana sadida tabi'een, wa ulama al-amaleen, wa a'imatul arabatun mujtahideen, wa muqalideen, illa yawmideen, amma ba'd, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Still talking about one of our ancestors, Umar ibn Sa'id. We're coming from the book that you see on the screen, writing his way to spiritual freedom, the life and works of Umar ibn Sa'id by Muhammad Abdullahi al-Ahari. And we are on page 87. So alhamdulillah, My 
brother Talib, sister Tasha, Fatima, Abdullah, Miss Joanne. I'm glad you're here too, Miss Joanne. Alhamdulillah. Wasn't the same without you. Imad, Hassan Ali, Kevin, Ahmed, Nathaniel, Imam, Anthony, and Abdullah, all of you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. We, like we said, we're on page 87. And just to remind you, this isn't necessarily just a biography of Umar ibn Sayyid. The focus is really on the things he wrote and the people he wrote to and communicated with directly and indirectly, inshallah. So as we said, we're on page 87. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Samira. Are you ready? Wa alaikum, salam to like the captain. Can you hear me? Yeah, hey. Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. It's me, loud. Let's go. Aul Dabalah, him and our Shaitan or Rajin. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, I seek refuge in Allah from the rejected shaitan. May Allah bless our master, Sayyidina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, companions, and give them peace. All praise is due to Allah, for he is sufficient for us. Peace be upon his slaves, whom he has chosen. As to what follows, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi to everyone. And wa alaikum wa sallam wa rahmatullahi to everyone that has given the greetings on page 87. Remarks on the Seracule Nation in Nagricia, in Nagricia. In other words, Africa. Mm. Accompanied by a vocabulary of their language. Now, this is written by the, this article was written by the same uh, author, uh, the, uh, Dwight Theodore, Theodore Dwight. This one was written in 1835. We'll get some good insights from here, inshallah. Bismillah, go ahead. And Sarukule is a tribe, an ethnic group, just like uh, others, like uh, Hausa, Fulani, Mandinka, Wolof. Sarukule is another well-known African tribe in the same areas that uh, we're talking about. In other words, in the Senegambia area, they are Sarokule. And I, I reminded you before, those of you who are on the tour, right? Who came on the tour with us, you met someone that was Sarokule. Do you remember who that was? And inshallah, you could type the answer. You can continue reading some there, inshallah. Bismillah. The following vocabulary, which has been obtained from a native African of education and for some years a teacher of, the, of a school in the Grecia, may possess some interest for the members of the Lyceum. At least one account of the source whence it is derived. It is understood to be the object of the society from the recent plan of organizing various departments to embrace a wide scope in the horizon of knowledge, and therefore no apology perhaps need to be made for introducing a communication on philology, philology, especially as the society has already published the valuable essay of Dr. James 
on the Chippewa language. And as there are some interesting facts in connection with it relating to education and derived from the Negritian schoolmaster. The individual from whom the vocabulary has been obtained has been a slave in the United States about 30 years. And during that time appears never to have acquired any considerable knowledge of things around him and to have been out of the way of all news from Africa. What is obtained from him, therefore, relates exclusive, exclusively to what he knew before leaving his native country. And his accounts are, in many points, remarkably confirmed by such travelers as have penetrated into Negritia, particularly, clearly, the enterprising Frenchman who has received I'm having some background noise. I mean, you're gonna have to mute yourself. Ooh. You. I'm hearing some background noise from your mic. What kind of background noise? I don't know. I, I hear myself like being repeated. You don't hear that? Uh, I hear it. No, I don't hear it, but I'll mute myself. Let me see if that will help. Just not. What is obtained from him, therefore, relates exclusively to what he knew before leaving his native country, and his accounts are in many points remarkably confirmed by such travelers as have penetrated into Negritia, particularly Cayley, the enterprising Frenchman who has received the reward offered by the French Geographical Society as the first white man who has returned from Timbuktu. Lemon Kebe, for that is his real name, was born in the kingdom of Futo Jalon and traveled sufficiently during his youth to give much interest to the accounts he communicates. He performed two journeys when quite young to the Jaliba or Niger River, in one instance in company with an army of Mohammedans in a successful war upon an idolatrous nation to convert them to Islamism. His education, which commenced at 14 and was finished at 21, was obtained chiefly at Bunda, the city in which a late and expensive English expedition of discovery met a fatal defeat from the natives. He was a schoolmaster five years in the city of Keben, which he left to travel to the coast to obtain paper for the use of his pupils when he was taken and sold as a slave. So, alhamdulillah, so again, he's writing about Lamin Kebe, who, uh, as he mentioned, from uh, Futa Jalon. Remember, you hear Futa, Futa a lot. You have Futa, Futa Toro, which is more north, and then you have Futa Jalon, which is further south. Both of them would be in the modern day country of Senegal. And so basically he's telling you, which I, I don't believe part of it is just, you know, how can he said uh, he'd been a slave in the United States for 30 years and uh, he basically said that he remained ignorant, at least that's the way I'm reading it remain ignorant. He didn't learn anything from his environment, you know, in, you know, in America or what was later to become America in, in 30 years. So basically all of his knowledge and all of his intellect comes from what he knew back home, right? And so, uh, and then he mentions that, uh, he, he, journey, he made two journeys and one of them was, he was part of a, our army of quote unquote Mohammedans or Muslims and they were going to war or they were doing jihad uh, against uh, some pagans. Uh, and we mentioned all of this already. But anyway, go ahead. Bismillah. He is of mixed extract, his father being a Serikule and his mother of the Menenka nation. 
and thus he had intimate acquaintance with various habits, manners, and languages from early life. The Seracule nation is known by name to the learned of Europe, but all the information given concerning them by Balbi in his late and learned atlas ethnographic amounts merely to this, and they are a body of traveling merchants and a speak and speak a language said to bound in gutturals and very difficult to learn. It appears, however, from Laman's account that they were for a for merely a nation of ignorant idolaters, dwelling northward from Futajalo, their capital being Dialan or Jaffnami. But a few generations past converted to Mohammedism by their prince, Moral Kebe, who abdicated his throne and took to study in the city of Jaga and afterwards introduced the religion of the prophet, so he was selling and learning among his people. The tr traditions obtained from Laman constantly present the progress of Islamism and education as companions in Nagrishia. The Seracule people sometimes- This is something that I hope that y'all not missing in all of this reading that we're doing. Like, we have to understand that ignorance and Islam, like oil and water, they don't really go together too good. Ignorance and in Islam. Wherever Islam goes, intelligence, learning, and education go with it. You know, the first verse revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam literally was Iqara, Bismi Rabbika Ladi Kalak, read in the name of your Lord. So the first revelation which appears in chapter 96, a uh, chapter named Alak, right? the first divine commandment to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a command to read. And then subsequently after that, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam famously said, talibu ilmi faridu ala kuli muslim. Seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every muslim. So where Islam goes, ignorance disappears. And if you find a place where there are Muslims and there's a lot of ignorance, you, you're not really dealing with real strong Muslims. You're dealing with nominal Muslims. As we said in the Jumu'ah Khutbah, every Muslim ain't a Muslim. A lot of Muslims are like the way many of us were before we took Shahada. Our parents were Christian, came from Christian homes, but we didn't, you know, we're not necessarily you know, what, I, what a lot of people will call Bible thumping Christians. We just Christian because our parents were Christian. And we have to remember that a lot of Muslim societies today, not only in our context here in America, but in even in a lot of Muslim countries, a lot of Muslims are just Muslim because their parents are Muslim. And many of them, many of us violate the, ten, the basic tenets of what it means to be a Muslim in the first place, even though we claim to be Muslim. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Isa, and my beloved sister, Kali Khadija, alhamdulillah. So, but I want you to just, just keep in mind, we're reading uh, an article from an American white person who's giving his opinions and his thoughts and what he learned from an African who was Sarakule, who was enslaved in America for 30 years. And, and, his, and from his account of what his homeland was like before you know, he was kidnapped and made into a slave. And in all of these accounts, one thing that's going, is going to stand out, knowledge and education. Even if these people as individuals were not intended to be scholars or teachers, the one thing that's still going to be there is knowledge. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Farooq. And so you have to keep in mind this, in other words, this is another elephant in the room. If we are Muslims here in the United States, right, and we really and seriously intend to be Muslim. We have to be really serious about our education. 
Every Muslim has to know the basics of what it is to be a Muslim. The bare minimum of what it takes to be uh, a believer, a Muslim. And what it and what can you believe, say, or do that will take you out of Islam. And the bare minimum about the Muslim practice, what we call fiqh. In other words, anything that is an obligation for us to do, it is likewise an obligation for us to learn about it. We don't just do things in ignorance. Like, I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna just do it anyway. We, we, we don't do that, right? We Once we know, okay, Allah says that we have to do this, or the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says that we have to do this, then we also automatically know, okay, now I have to learn how to do this thing properly. It goes hand in hand. So uh, I hope you're not missing that because sometimes, a lot of times we look at things, we read books or we hear lectures and we're looking for the extra deep point that nobody's going to catch and we miss the obvious point that's sitting right in front of us. So just keep in mind that he's t telling about his, his society that he came from and most of it is based upon education. You know, this is what makes Islam strong and great is that even the common people, even the non-scholar, the non-government official, the non-clergy has a baseline level of knowledge. And if you look around us, we are failing in that. This is why every single generation you find that we got to reinvent the wheel. I take Shahada, right? I become Muslim, I get married, I have children, they leave the deen, and then somebody else takes Shahada, and then we just keep redoing the thing over and over and over again. Because we haven't we haven't taken seriously our education and the education of our families. Continue. Bismillah. The Sarakula people sometime after this were driven from their capital, Diaja or Jaga, by the plague of locusts, and a portion of them entering Futa Jalo, conquered by the e conquered the eastern half of that kingdom, which they have ever since held. Particulars have been obtained concerning this nation, its traditions, manners, manufacturers, schools, high schools, etc., which cannot at present be given for a want of time. With regard to the language, instead of corresponding with the brief and rather unfavorable account given of it by Balbi on the barren and questionable authority of a few charred travelers who do not pretend to an acquaintance with it, it proves to be agreeable, sonorous, and easy to the organs of speech. Neither is it- Please, please keep in mind that this is you know, not modern day American English parlance. This is 1835. So, you know, uh, bear with it, inshallah. Bismillah. <clears throat> Neither is it in other respects so barbarous a tongue as has been supposed. A list is herewith given of about 30 books written in it and in use in the schools. A number of these are translations from the Arabic and altogether form a complete course of Negrician education, which is, of course, defective in many material points, but yet worthy of attention on various accounts and so far as the writer is able to ascertain as yet unknown to the learned of Europe. So on one hand, he's expressing, you know, that he doesn't have all the information but at the same time saying saying it's defective, right? So, you know, just keep in mind that, you know, uh, as Muslims, especially Black Muslims, African-American Muslims, we have to be real conscious and diligent with ourselves in that, that we don't subconsciously do things to seek of the approval of others, outsiders, right? You have to keep that in mind because we, we do it and we, we, we're unconscious that we do it a lot of times. Almost any discussion we have about fixing something or repairing something or building something, somebody's gonna say, well, what if they don't like it? Or what if they don't accept it? 
Who cares if they don't like it or they don't accept it? So we have to keep that in mind. Sorry. I don't know if you're reading, but I don't hear nothing. You're muted. Sorry about that. Bismillah. It may well strike us as a singular fact that while the geographers of Europe have been exhausting their scanty means of conjecture on the natural features of Negritia and her most enterprising explorers have been hazarding and sacrificing their lives to penetrate to the banks of the Niger, we should meet with a man who has been living, despised, and a slave in our own land in possession of not a few of the secrets thus anxiously sought for by the learned locked up in his breast or that were not communicated because he was totally unconscious of the importance with which that knowledge was invested great difficulty just keep in mind the author of the book that we read our brother muhammad he says that his translation for negrita is just africa so i guess this negrita or however you pronounce it I guess was one of the terms they used for Africa back then. Uh, and basically he, um, I say the, uh, the author of the article that we're reading, he's saying that basically instead of, you know, trying to depend on travelers who rarely get any information, we got somebody right here that's been a, that's been a slave, you know, and live in a lowly existence here and he got all the information we need right in his right in his breast right in his chest right in his mind right and he don't even know how important it, that this information is uh, this is basically what he's saying See? bismillah great difficulty has been found in obtaining such information on various subjects as he is supposed to be in possession of chiefly owing to his ignorance of the English language and the limited or mistaken views he entertains of things he has witnessed among us. Malte Brun makes but the faintest allusion to such a thing as high education among the Mohammedan Negroes. And we naturally find even in our latest geographies, scarce an allusion to education of any kind. Evidence, however- Then you have to keep it, you have to keep in mind, this is extremely important, right? Uh, European, the European, what Europeans consider knowledge and, and things of this nature is way different from what Muslims consider knowledge. I'll give you one example of what I'm talking about. When Alex Haley was inspired by Mike, Malcolm X to uh, trace his family and what resulted in the book and the series roots right when he pieced together and got this narrative from his his family roots is from his mother's alex haley's mother's side or father's side because i know later on he did another thing called queenie which was the opposite side of the family somebody remind me roots was alex haley's mother's side or father's side i forget but in any case, when he took those narratives and then, you know, went to the National Archives and uh, looked to see where the African, who, who happened to be Kuta Kente, who they renamed Toby, what ship he came on and where that ship came from and all of the little words and little bits and tidbits that his family would relate to him. When he traced that back to the country that we now know is Gambia, and he made it to where Kute Kente came from. And he spoke to the historian of Jufere at the time. And I, I got a, I wrote his name down because I don't want to forget it. Where is that? Kebe Kanje Fofana, right? Uh, when he met, when he met uh, her, him, excuse me, when he met him, and he started giving a general history of their people, their their family, and then when he got up to Kutikente's time, it's it's basically 
He had one side of the story up to Kuta Kente from the slave plantation. He went to Africa, he got the oral history, and then he got to Kuta Kente, and then it matched. And I know that feeling. That's subhanAllah. He got he's sitting and the whole village was around. Just, just just imagine those of us who went to Gambia, where we met uh Kuta Kente's family, where we were sitting at. Just imagine we sitting right there and the and the uh and the person's kicking their whole history, right? And you got somebody translating. And then what you already knew on your head, in your head from the American side, now you hear in the African side, then it gets up to that time period and it just comes together and it matches, right? And uh so he took all that information, he made more than one trip, and then he wrote his book, right? Do you know that years later, European scholars followed his footsteps, met with uh, Kebe Kanje Fofana, right? And heard the same history from him. It was like, now this is just uh, old fairy tales, you know, old stories, you know, it's not in any book, so we can't take that. <laughs> because it's not in the book, it's not published, it's not no manuscript or nothing. So we just reject it, right? Right. Because see, uh, Alex Haley had two problems. He plagiarized some portions of the book, and then after then, and then on top of that, you had you know academics coming behind them saying, "Well, okay, we can't find what you said in no book, so it ain't true." <laughs> right? If you think about that, if if that's your criteria for accepting a narration or not, right? Then you throw the whole religion of Islam out the window. Right, because the the Quran and the Sunnah, what Quran and Hadith specifically weren't put into book form until after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, so and that's what a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people are trapped trapped in Western pedagogy method, you know, systems of or styles of education, methods of learning, and so they, they think like some some even people who think that they're Muslim, like some people reject Hadith based upon this misunderstanding. They say, well, the Hadith books weren't compiled, like Bukhari didn't come to three, 400 years after the Prophet Wasallam. So these are just words of men, right? Like, brother, calm down, have two seats, right? You know, our tradition is not, is not, based on the written word. The written word comes later. It's a support for, not the foundation of, okay? So even Iqra, the word mean like Qara'a, to recite, right? Like the Hafiz of Quran, he doesn't become the Hafiz of Quran because he can write the Quran. He recites it from memory. It's the memory that's the foundation. And it was because so many Hufad were killed during the battle of Yamama against Musalam the liar, that Umar ibn al-Khattab suggested to Abu Bakr that they collect the Quran in book form, you know, sort of like a backup, right? And so that's when that, when that happened, even with the Quran itself. So for us, the foundation of, the, of a narration is not based on whether it's written with ink on a piece of paper or not. The foundation of a narration is on the one who narrates it. Is he truthful? Does he have a good memory? Is he reliable? Is he upright? All of these things that make a narration sound, right? It, it's, it's, the in, it's the one carrying the message, not, not whether the message is written down or not. Like when, for example, when uh, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came back from his isra and mi'raj, he came back to Mecca and told the people, and the kufar, the disbelievers, start laughing at him and you know making jokes and like they was like, oh, we got him now. Ain't nobody gonna believe this stuff. He went from Mecca to Jerusalem last night. He's back. That's six hundred miles. There's no airplanes. There's no trains. There's no cars. Right? He did this last night. <laughs> All right? Oh, ain't nobody. 
well, we got him now. People are going to leave him when they hear this nonsense. <laughs> so they went and told Abu Bakr. You know what your man is saying? Your man said he went to Jerusalem last night, right? Abu Bakr, without even blinking, he said, if he said it, then it's true. And his words is so deep because even there, you find the foundation for the science of Hadith itself. We don't care what you say. You would disbelieve or whatever. What you say is really irrelevant. Abu Jahl is the one who went to Abu Bakr, right? He said, if he said it, Meaning, if the messenger of Allah said it, the Isnad, right? If he said it, then it's true, right? We don't do it the other way. We look at what's said, and then we check the person. No, we check the person before we even get to what is said, right? A hadith has two parts to it. It has the Isnad, the chain, the, the people who uh, uh, transmitted it until it got up to you. And then it has the text or what is being said or narrated. So I just want to uh, keep this in, I want everybody to keep this in mind, inshallah. Continue. Bismillah. Evidence, however, has been obtained from the informant before mentioned, not only of men who have devoted years to study and instruction and the names of those who have been have been successfully the most distinguished teachers and pupils connected with the history of the progress and decay of learning in different regions. Hut also the names of women who have been devoted teachers for life and have rivaled some of the most celebrated of the other sects in success and reputation for talent and extraordinary acquisitions. Schools in several of the countries of interior and Agricia are supported by the government on such a liberal and judicious system that all children have the means of instruction in reading and writing at least on low terms, while the poor are taught at the public expense. Taxes being laid to laid hey, to pay. Hey, 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 hey. So he's saying in Africa, remember when you hear Negrita, it is Africa. In Africa, right? The teachers get paid well, meaning in the schools. Obviously, it's not now because after the colonial period, right? So the teachers get paid well. I think if you talk to any teacher, they will tell you that they don't get paid well. And, it's, and if you think about it, it's crazy because they spend the most time with our children in this society because education is mandated here, right? So you send your children off to school early in the morning and they come back in the afternoon and the people that are spending the most time with your children, not just giving them information, but you know, dealing with their character, shaping their character and everything, you pay them the least, right? There's a whole lot of professions that where people get paid more than teachers. And that's a crime if you think about it. That's actually a crime. And another thing that I want to mention, you have to keep in mind that again, these writers are writing from a, a, a position of false superiority, even the good white folk that's writing right here, right? Because last before, when we, when we read his other article, we see how he was really getting on other white folks for, you know, thinking low of black people or Africans, et cetera, like that. So this is actually, you know, uh, you no, know, what's the word? One of our allies. But a lot of times, even our allies, subconsciously, they're looking down on us. And I need you to think about this because it's extremely important. Allahu subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions in Surah Al-Rahman, you know, which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? How does that surah begin? Ar-Rahman, Allam al-Qur'an, Qalak al-Insan, the most merciful. He taught the Qur'an. He created man. Allamahu al-Bayan, 
he taught man speech, right? So language, speech, is connected to intellect, right? Because the, your, your language that you learn, your language that you know how to speak is governing how you think, right? And so you dealing with people who think they are superior, many of them only know one language. And even back during this time and still up to the, till today, the average African you run across is speaking three languages minimum. So a people that you describe as dumb and slow, whatever, are actually more smarter than you, just even from that measurement, right? Measure language. I'm sure we, us African-Americans can bear witness. Any Africans uh, that, that, we, that we meet here, they, they speak in three languages, minimum, minimum. Even the Africans that were born here, but they, but they both of their parents are from back home and they preserve the tradition in their house, living in America, even they will speak more, at least three languages. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna anzawnahu Qur'anan arabiyan la'alakum ta'aqilun. Indeed, we have revealed this as an Arabic language so that you will use your intellect. So in that verse, Allah is showing you that there's a connection between the language and the intellect. And these, our brothers and sisters, past and present, speak more than one language, more than one language. And so you have to think, just think about it. Just don't just, oh, okay, yeah, they speak more. Yeah, if you speak the language, that means you can think in that language. Languages are different. A lot of times because we don't understand languages, we don't, we don't really understand what somebody is saying to us as deep as they are, right? Because a lot of us, we don't, uh, we don't get too much into grammar, or whatever, right? But like, say, for example, if I say I'm actively doing something, right? That means I, which is the subject, I'm doing it. But if I say I'm passively doing something, right? Linguistically, at least in Arabic, right? When, when, a, when something is passive, that means the subject is still a subject, but instead of him or her doing the thing, that thing is being done to them. So if I say I'm passively doing something and and I'm speaking from the not just common everyday speech, but I'm speaking, you know, more in line with the Arabic language. The person is not going to understand what I'm saying. They're going to think the way we use passive, we usually use it as somebody's being soft. So somebody, somebody's going to think I'm talking about, you know, being tough or being soft or being backdoor aggressive, because that's the other way we use passive, passive aggressive, right? He's not just outwardly aggressive, he's passively aggressive. Right. But if you don't understand language, that whole point, I mean, we just fly right over your head. So just think. These our brothers and sisters are speaking more than one language, which means they are thinking in more than one language. Right. And so a lot a lot of these people who assume that they are superior and more intellectual than them is, in fact, the other way around. Right. And it's only by the decree of Allah that uh, that Allah is giving you power over them. Continue. Oh. Bismillah. I just saw your message. Mm -hmm. Bismillah. Right. So schools in several of the countries of interior of of interior. Uh, Negritia are supported by the. Oh, I already said that one or two. Okay, I'll reread it because you stopped me. Schools in several of the countries of Interior Negritia are supported by the government on such a liberal and judicious system that all the children have the means of instruction in reading and writing at least on low terms, 
while the poor are taught at the public's expense. Taxes being laid to pay the master or mistress. Private schools are also very numerous, particularly in the larger towns of some of the most learned nations. In some schools, boys and girls are under the Page 91, Issa. Read. I'm just answering Issa. He said what page? In the larger towns of some of the most learned nations. In some schools, boys and girls are under the care of the same master, but they are placed in separate rooms. Our informant had from 55 to 57 pupils in his native town after he had completed his education, among whom were four or five girls. His scholars, according to the plan pursued in his education, were seated on the floor, each upon a sheepskin and with small boards held up upon one knee, rubbing over with a whitish chalk or powder. Hey, hey. Uh, before you keep reading, uh, I'm sorry, Issa, she was actually on page 90. Now she's on page 91 at the top. Uh, uh, many of you remember when we went to Gambia, we got lessons on how to write on the board. This paragraph, he's talking about those boards now, inshallah. So pay attention. Bismillah. Rubbed over with a whitish chalk or powder on which they were made to write with pens made of reeds and ink, which they formed with care of various ingredients. The copy is set by the master by tracing the first words of the Quran with a dry reed, which removes the chalk where it touches. The young pupil follows these marks with ink, which is afterwards rubbed over with more chalk. They are called up, a, called up three at a time to recite to the master who takes the boards from them and makes them turn their backs to him and repeat what they were to do the previous day, which they have a decided interest in doing to the best of their recollection, because it is the custom to mark every mistake with the stroke of a stick upon the shoulders. The mind of our informant shows some of uh, the- Just uh, two things. They're using the word informant. I mean, he's using the word informant. I don't think he means informant as in a way of like the way we use it now, a government agent or a snitch or something like that. He's talking to someone that's enslaved and he's informing him of how he was raised and how he grew up. Uh, and also uh, he mentions here that, you know, uh, that uh, what they will call now corporal punishment is used in the in the Quran schools, like every mistake, they get a little tapped. Right. Continue. Bismillah. The mind of our informant shows some of the traits of a professional schoolmaster, and his opinions on pedagogy claim some attention, as they are founded on experience and independent of those current in other countries. It is of great importance. Lamin remarks that children should not be allowed to change school. In our country, no such thing is known or permitted, except when absolutely necessary. It is indeed permitted to a boy who has learned all his master has to teach to seek other teachers during the recess of his own school, if he does not neglect his own. And it is not uncommon thing for intelligent youth to attend the instructions of two or three teachers at different hours of the day. But it's very wrong to do as your children do in this country. When a boy has been punished or for any reason dislikes his teacher, you let him run all about to the school and that, and he learns nothing and is good for nothing. You should be very hey, careful. This, this, this is this is still uh, practice today, and in this and this uh, this is a slap in the face to the comments that this you know Theodore Dwight mentioned earlier. He's been here 30 years and he done, he didn't learn nothing from what he sees around him, right? Look what he just quoted from him, right? <laughs> right? He said, we don't do like y'all do here, right? Y'all let your kids go buck wild and let them change schools and just, you know, he complain about his teacher, let him go crazy, right? So, but I thought he didn't, he didn't learn nothing from his environment though, right? <laughs> right? So you gotta watch these jokers, man. They always contradict themselves, go ahead. Bismillah, you should be very careful to what kind of teacher you get for your child. He must not be too severe because the boy will be looking out all the while 
for a whip, whipping and cannot study. And he will should not be an easy man because if children have their own way, they will not study. You never know. You never know one that would. An easy man will let them have their own way, and therefore they will never. They never will learn. But you should get a middleman for a schoolmaster. He will not frighten the boys all the time so they cannot study, but yet he can speak to them now and then as if he would eat them up, and they will not forget it for months. It is interesting to the Friends of Education America to hear the, of the improvements introduced in the schools of other countries. Lamin Kebe was a high opinion of a certain process practiced in some of the institution of his land, native land, which he calls doubting, while of those in which it is not practiced. He speaks with comparative contempt. In schools of the latter, in common class, the Quran is, te is taught in Arabic alone, which not being the vulgar language of any of the Negroes is totally intelligible, unintelligible. In those in which the important process of do doubling is adopted, the meaning of the Arabic words is explained as well as translated. He, he inquiries, and he inquires with some interest whether the doubling or explaining system is a properly cultivated in the United States. The preceding remarks, although brief, will afford a general idea of the interesting information furnished by this age African. The limits proper to be occupied on such a subject as this on an, on an occasion like the present will not allow a more detailed account. And the principal object proposed was to preserve the vocabulary of the Seracule language. It is possible that a few words may be Arabic through misapprehension on my part, as Lemon often mentioned names of things in two languages. So uh, on page 94 and 95, he mentioned some of these words in 96. We're not going to read that. Go straight to page 97. Uh, Bismillah. I received from Lemon, Ke Lemon Kebe orally the following list of books studied in the College of Bunda during the regular course of six years. The names of the books only are here given. The author's name, many of which I have, being long. Nahai Faki. You can skip all of those books, but uh, three books that stand out you know even in in their language is the three books dealing with the creed by imam sanusi which is you know a staple in the african continent and the ahlu sunnah wal jamaah you know straight asher the creed right go to the last paragraph these appear to be chiefly books on the muhammadan religion including some books of hymns prayers commentaries dictionaries etc Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So we'll uh, pause there while uh, I'll wait to see if any of you have any questions. Alhamdulillah, if you have any questions, please type them down now. Inshallah, while I'm waiting for your questions, uh, I want to uh, show you all something. In, uh, in Gambia, they've been having very bad flooding, right? And so, uh, I just want to show you, give you a little taste of what it's like over there. Hold on.
Yeah, that was like a five minute video. I just showed you all that little section right there just to give you a taste of how bad it is. Uh, and I wanna show you a couple of video clips. Uh, this is the mat, one of the matches that we visited when we visited uh, Kunta Kente's hometown. And uh, the masjid, you know, they're, they're building, they have a masjid there, but they're building another masjid across the street because they get water, real serious water damage or whatever. So uh, our brother, Lamine, he sent me these videos, inshallah. So this is the old, this is the old masjid. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh, my favorite Muslim brothers and sisters. This is the central mosque of Al Breda, which is constructed by the community themselves in 1995 to date. Unfortunately, the construction was very, not very solid but of quality. And so, for the past years, the central mosque has been suffering from leakage and cracking from the upper roof of a concrete floor, which is leaking daily, especially in the rainy season. So, terrible, it become fearing and whatsoever. And then in periods of this time, like the rainy season becomes so terrible, people can come feared of coming to pray because every side of the mosque is leak. You can see the carpets, others have been all been removed from the one other side of it because it leaks every day. When there is rain, it leaks. So today is Friday prayers. You can see still yet, the part of the mosque is without even a place to stretch the mattresses or carpets for people to form their uh, Friday prayers. So you can see carpet falling down there, fall, falling there simply because of the various of the mosque that get leaks. And you can see the con top concrete floors make, make it fear for people to gather in larger numbers to perform their prayers, daily prayers in the central mosque of Al-Breda. And then you can see the situation, why it become fear and complex to the people to perform their daily prayers. So therefore, from last year, the people of the community have started to embark on the construction of a new, new central mosque. It is still yet to be under construction, yet to be completed. So there, my brothers and sisters, this very community of Alberta, uh, Alberta is seeking support in whatever form possible to construct their new mosque so they can safely shift here before any calamity or any terrible incident could have happened for them gathering in this mosque here in larger numbers, especially in the days of Fridays, to perform their congregation prayers. So definitely, brothers and sisters, it will be laudable and well looking forward for any kind of support from anyone from any part of the world that can help. Alhamdulillah. Then from here, I'll be going out to show you the new mosque, which is also under construction, where the people are struggling since last year, the uh, year before last, to construct the mosque. And that one is yet to be completed. So from here, I'll begin there to see you, show you the face of that other part of the mosque, which is under construction, to for them to quit this one because it's a risky position at this point in time. Just in case you didn't understand, and what he was saying was that the masjid that they currently have was built poorly. So when it rains, you know, you see the rain coming through the ceiling. Right. And this year, as you all know, the rains have been very bad. And so even for Juma, they had to fold the carpets back and everything. You know, Juma prayer is full, right? But they but it's raining on them. So in the masjid. So they had to fold the carpets back and you know it's a rough situation, right? And so uh those of you who came with us to the Gambia, when we went to uh Dufere, when we went to uh Kuta Kente's hometown, right? When we got off the bus, this is the first masjid we prayed in, if you remember. When we got off the bus, we made wudu, we used the bathroom, and then we prayed dhur. there. That's that same masjid. And this is right across the street. This is, they're building this one in order to replace that one. But they don't really have money like that. And it's, they've been doing it for over a year, and it still ain't been built yet. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh my brothers and sisters. Like I promised, 
I was from the older mosque that was constructed in 1995 by the people of the community for gathering together to perform their day prayers and congregation prayers on Friday. But due to this situation of the mosque, which is at a very risky position, and then so much uh, problems happening there for fear and complexity and for safety reasons to avoid risk and whatsoever, the gathering of the mosque. So therefore, the community have come and put together all the resources with the sons and daughters to support and to build a new masjid where they can do their prayers for safety reasons with their families and everyone and Muslims all over the country and outside the country where, because Alberta is a central village where people from all parts of the country or any part of the world can at one day pay in there. So that's why the people have started coming over to put all their resources and energy physically and mentally into this particular new mosque to the construction so that the old the other mosque could be abundant to avert any risk for more of this or tendency of whatever may happen. Hello. So for that being the case therefore brothers and sisters, this for this noble work of Allah, we are seeking the support of every individual, wherever you might be, wherever you might be around the globe, to support in this very endeavor in this struggle for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that this masjid can be completed to save lives of our Muslim brothers and sisters down in the Gambia in the village of Al Breda. So in therefore I thank you all. This is your brother Lamin Tawale from the village of Al Breda. Therefore I thank and then see look forward for your interventions and your support, my brothers and sisters, why very much thank you so much. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So for those of you who came with us to Gambia, you know that after we prayed there, we went across the street and we we took pictures, videos and everything standing right there where he where he's at right now. And so, you know, since the rains have been very, very, very hard, it's like a sense of urgency, right? So, you know, alhamdulillah. And we, alhamdulillah, we gave some while we were there. And trust me, they, they definitely appreciated that. And so he sent me that video, you know, hoping and expecting me to share it all with you so that you all can uh, donate and so that I can send him the money so that we can speed this process up of their masjid. And so this is what I'm doing. Alhamdulillah. We mentioned this yesterday and we're mentioning it again today. Uh, please, if you uh, find it in your heart to donate for the sake of Allah, Please donate to build that masjid. You know, before that masjid, let or something crazy like the roof comes down on them, or, or something like that. And it's not like here where you have, you know, maybe a brick frame or a wood frame, and then there's wood in the house. No, 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 no. It's all concrete. So if that thing comes crumbling down while somebody's in it, lie, 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 lie. right? So we don't want that to happen. So let's try to support them the best way we can. And we know that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us, he said, Men bana masjid lillahi. Whoever builds a masjid for Allah, bana Allahu lahu fil jannah mithlahu. That Allah will build for them, for, for him in paradise, the like of it. So <clears throat> this is your opportunity to get you a spot, a nice spot in paradise, in jannah you know, by helping support this masjid. And it don't take, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars like it takes for us to build a masjid over here. They, you know, they don't need, they don't need like uh, much money like that, but they do, they, they do need some money. And like we mentioned yesterday, I don't want you to think that, oh, there's a lot of tourists going through there. So, you know, the tourist is going to be, uh, donate into that, to build that masjid. No, the tourists don't go to that masjid. We went to that masjid because we have a relationship with them, and <clears throat> but they don't bring tourists to the masjid or anything like that. So I'm asking you, I'm going to post my uh, cash app. Tamara, are you there? I don't know if she's still there. I don't think she's there. This is my cash app. Put it on the screen.
if you if you all could drop something in my cash app and just put like Masjid Gambia, Masjid Alberta, Jufre, whatever, so I know what it's for. Because uh, I want to send them send them something by the middle of the week, inshallah. So please, 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 I gotta find my paper. PayPal, PayPal. I don't remember this stuff. You can send it here. Spelling stuff wrong. This is one of our PayPal, uh, <clears throat> PayPal accounts. You see a copy of the Musalama lessons up there. That's us. I prefer Cash App because they don't take fees, but. Maybe you don't prefer a cash app. We'll take, we'll take it whichever way you give it to us. But help us help them. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah. So the cash app is on the screen. Let me put both of them. Yeah, help them out. You know, alhamdulillah, these, uh, these are good people. They facilitate things for us when we're there. You know, uh, you know, they treat us like family and they don't give us the cookie cutter treatment, right? Like they do with everyone else. You know, they bring us into their homes, you know, uh, into their masters. We, we met with their elders. You know, they gave us their blessings and thanked us for coming. And all that kind of stuff because they really they really appreciate because where that village is is <clears throat> really <clears throat> it's like what do y'all say in new york we say it's in the boondocks like it's in the middle of nowhere what y'all say in pittsburgh something something's in the middle of nowhere what y'all say outskirts man that sounds like a technical word man what y'all say in the hood man It's like out in the somebody might say out in the stick someplace someplace they say that <laughs> out in the sticks out no man's land whatever you call it wherever uh where where this place at is like that so the only reason where outsiders will really be in that area is because of you know Kutikente, you know Kente Island, which used to be called uh, James Island before that, Andrews Island, and the museum there, that little spot right by the water. That's the only reason outsiders come. And tourists don't even come there like they used to. It, if you've never been to Gambia, but maybe you've been to Senegal, and you know about Gory Island, right? Don't think that Jufere has got as much traffic as Gory Island. It's not like that. It's like night and day. Right. So when they see people coming, it's like, ah, finally some tourists, some money. Right. <laughs> right. But, you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, we came as a Muslim group. Right. And so, you know, so it was a breath of fresh air from them. And one of the brothers was almost in tears. One of the one of the tour guides was almost in tears. He was like, I've been doing this for like 12 years. And this is the first time that a group of Muslims came. 
you got individuals that's Muslim that come, but usually they're used to Europeans coming and all that kind of stuff. So they get the, you know, they get the sanitized, you know, version, whatever. But you know, the, we came, right? <laughs> and so they were very grateful that we came. Very, very grateful that we came, right? You know, it was everybody who's on a tour with us can bear witness, right? So we brought food from the restaurant that they have there, right? But on top of that, they gave us food from their own house, their own house. They prepared some Benetton for us, right? On our little promotion that we put on the beginning uh, in the end of the uh, classes now, that bo big bowl of food that you see, that's there. And the brother that's, that was speaking in that video, our tour guy, his wife made that. You know. So, you know, these people are like extended family, you know. Uh, you know, you know let, let us help construct that master before something bad happens in that old master, right? So, you know, please don't forget. Please, please, please don't forget. And don't think, well, I don't got that much money. I only have a little bit. Trust me, your little bit will go far over there. And your 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 little bit with sincerity may be more than my a whole lot of money with not as much sincerity. So don't don't judge your don't judge your sadaka based upon how much you think you don't have. Just be sincere when you do it. Because the hadith that we mentioned. From the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whoever builds a masjid, Lillahi, you know, for the sake of Allah, right? So it's about the intention, it's about the niyyah. And Allah might put barakah, He might put spiritual energy and blessings in that little bit of money that you gave. We see, we think, we think of things like, we think of things like materially, right? You go to the store to buy something, right? And the person gives you a break or a discount or whatever. Just think, they going to buy some materials. They going to buy some materials for the masjid, right? And maybe your, your part of that sadaka, maybe your part of that sadaka uh, has the barakah in it. So they go to buy some cement with the money that you donate, donated. And maybe, you know, the person that's selling the cement, oh, this for the masjid over there? Hey, take this free, right? Or, or here's a deep discount, right? Where they may be able to get more. Maybe because your your part of the money has a barricade. We don't, we we don't, you can't measure that. And there's no way for you to of knowing that directly. <clears throat> but it's real. So uh, you know, uh, you know, please, you know, when you know, when whenever we go to Gambia, right, and, and we go visit them, this is like home. You know, they look at us like really like long lost cousins. And it's, not, it's different than the maybe the other regular person on the street because they live around the tourist attraction. They know why people are coming. They know about Alex Haley and Roots and, and how Kuta Kente wasn't the only one, right? There's a whole business endeavor for the Europeans. And so when they see us, not the descendants of those who kidnapped Kuti Kente come. When they see us, the, the, the descendants of those who were kidnapped like Kuti Kente, when they see us come there, it's a it's a whole different thing. They feel it and they, they really appreciate it. So, and and we come, we coming back, not as non-Muslims, we coming back with the religion that Kuti Kente left with, the one they tried to take from him, right? And so it's so it's like you got to think about it from their perspective. Like, these, these are not Europeans. These are not black non-Muslims. They're Muslim. And they're coming back. And they want to come to the masjid. They want to pray when we pray. Right? So it's a, it's a whole different it's a whole different thing. Right? And so that's why it's all love when we go out there. And so, you know, that love will only increase, you know, if we help them, you know, save their master, well, building one across the street, and they'll be, they'll be able to do away with the one that was built so poorly. So help me help them. You know, we're not doing it for us, right? If we sincere, we're not doing it for us. We're doing it for the sake of Allah. But there is benefit for us. 
when we go back there, they know that they, they, these are the ones who help build our masjid, right? But we're not doing it for that. And don't let that creep in your attention. So I don't see any questions about the class. Let me scroll up to make sure I didn't miss any questions. Okay. Alhamdulillah. So we'll be back tomorrow, inshallah, if Allah gives us tawfiq. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik and ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta wa astaghfiruka wa tibu ilayk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in knowledge, increase us in sincerity, and increase us in himma, and drive, and motivation to go out and establish the deen in, our, in ourselves, in our hearts, and in our families, and in our lives in general. While asra in al insan ala fi khus illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawassaw bil haqq wa tawassaw bis sabr assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh